Uh, with us tonight, uh, Wallace Broker uh, from uh, Columbia, from the Lamont Doherty. Uh, he's been at Columbia his whole academic career with a BS from here and a PhD in geology from here and a named professorship, Newberry Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences here. Uh, he's also Wally. <laughs> he's, he's a delightful uh, person who really brings clarity to a lot of these uh, otherwise uh, relatively obscure earth science issues. And he does that by his basic scale analysis and knowledge of processes that go on throughout the planet. And I don't want to do a long introduction here. I do, I do want to remember, however, while I'm doing this, to thank our sponsors who brought us together for the last several weeks in a row. And that's the Hertog uh, Foundation. And Roger Hertog has made a gift to this program that allows us to have a seminar on global strategies. This is the fourth seminar uh, in a row in four, four different summers. And uh, I was told just in the hallway that it's the best one, but uh, I haven't been involved in the other three. But we're looking at the history of climate uh, issues on a global scale and also global governance and, and trying to bring the two conversations together. And I think uh, from what I heard, we had an earlier seminar at four o'clock, and what I've heard is that uh, our speaker tonight has a real uh, skill and talent and ability to do that. Uh, Wally Broker is uh, known to have a, 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 a great climate beast in his office. You still have your pet dragon? It's outside my office. Oh, it's outside. Uh, he's also known for coining, uh, in a way, the term global warming in a paper he wrote. Um, and he's also known as the person that conceived the notion of a great oceanic conveyor belt of overturning circulation in the ocean. Uh, he wrote uh, How to Build a Habitable Planet, which I think every geoscientist has read. That book was published in 1985, and now with a colleague, Charles Langmuir, he's come out with a new book called How to Build a Habitable Planet, and it's a new edition which uh, gives a, a sense of uh, where we've come from there. Uh, he's a lot of honors, and he's just a great guy, and, and I wanted to uh, introduce him briefly to you and uh, turn the podium over to um, Wally Broker, who will speak tonight about carbon dioxide issues in, on a global sense. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be provocative. I think, you know, we're facing a CO2 crisis, not just a problem. The reason I say that is that there seems to be no limit on the amount of fossil fuels we can get out of the earth. Uh, the new drive to fract everything and get all the natural gas and more petroleum out has suddenly increased the inventories of fossil fuels. It's also reduced the price of them so that it makes it harder for alternate energies to uh, get a toehold. Uh, we've been, ever since I've been involved in this, 85% of the energy we use on the planet comes from carbon burning and 15% from all the other things. And that hasn't changed. Of course, the alternates have gone up in parallel with the use of energy. In uh, 1990, as a world, we produced 20 billion tons of CO2, 20 billion tons. Last year, we produced 32. So, and as some of you read, you know, we for a couple days, the CO2 observatory on Hawaii recorded full days of more than 400 parts per million. Uh, we know from ice cores that have beautifully preserved air bubbles in them that CO2 prior to the Industrial Revolution was uh, just about 280 parts per million. So we've gone up from 280 to 400. Um, we've also we're going up at about two and a half parts per million a year. So if we stayed at this level uh, in 25 years, we'd be up 
another, I mean, in 10 years would be up another 25 ppm. So we're, and there, there's no indication that the world is going to come to grips with this problem. That's the sad thing. In the U.S., 50% of the people don't believe it's a problem. And, and so that's an enormous impediment to getting anything done since politicians want votes. Um, so there's a man here named Klaus Lochner who I'll speak about quite a bit. He uh, was telling me the other day that if you look to the future and say, what do we have to do to cut fossil fuel emissions to the point where CO2 stops its rise, not bringing it down, just stop it from going up? And he did the calculation this way. He said that population is going to increase 1% a year uh, per capita. GNP is probably going to increase 3% a year, and that's what it's been doing. So if that continues, that's 4% a year. Then if you want to um, stop CO2 from doubling, we'd have to sort of reduce emissions 6% every year. That's incredible. I mean, to uh, that the amount of money that would cost is, is uh, staggering. And, you know, Obama just said that he wanted to cut emissions by 17 percent by the year 2020. So that's seven years, 17 percent. That's just between two and three percent a year. Um, and that'll never happen, I don't think. I mean, it's easy to say these things, it's very hard to implement them. Kyoto, I mean, it was rather modest goals, but they weren't, largely weren't achieved. So I think that it's very unlikely that the CO2 rise will be quelled before it reaches double and if we're unlucky, it could triple. There's plenty of fossil fuels to do that. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that fossil fuels are worth a lot of money. And so if we expect people to leave them in the ground and not sell them, uh, it's unlikely. The Canadian tar sands I, we're trying to, many people are trying to stop the Keystone Pipeline, which will allow those tar sand sludges to be sent to our refineries in, in uh, southern, in, you know, in Houston or wherever they are. And, um, but if those tar sands are worth a trillion dollars or more, so if we don't allow the Keystone Pipeline, Canada, with this enormous resource, will find a way to ship it to China or something, and it'll get burned. So that's the unfortunate thing, is that um, as long as we don't put a price on carbon, it's going to be the cheapest uh, source of energy for a long time. And that means that CO2 is going to keep going up. Okay, so what's it going to do? Well, we are talking just before about agriculture. Agriculturalists say that <clears throat> for every degree we heat the planet, every degree centigrade, grain yields will drop by 10%. Doubling CO2, the best estimates we have from uh, global simulations and computer models would be between three and three and a half degrees warming. So that would be 35 percent decrease in food pr in grain production if everything else stayed equal. But CO2 itself is going to increase production somewhat, but most people think that it's not going to compensate. 
plus um, pests take a toll on what we grow and the predictions are from ecologists that that toll or an agriculturalist that toll is going to go up so it means we'll get a smaller percentage of the food and they'll get it than we do now and they'll get a greater percentage um, I'm very involved in trying to understand how rainfall will change on the planet and uh, I think it's clear that as we heat the planet more of the rainfall that it's, it's here it's, there won't be that much more total rain on the planet but it's good <coughs> it's going to be focused <coughs> more strongly <coughs> more strongly on the tropics and therefore places that don't need more rainfall are going to get more and those that many places that <coughs> are very short of water are going to get less so that's another um, thing that we have to really worry about I think sea level which is often the primary thing people talk about sure sea level is going to rise very slowly but it's not the thing that's going to stab us in the back it's food that uh, and uh, the presumed intensification of, of storms this is the, the things that we're really going to notice so <clears throat> this is sort of a bleak outlook because if we keep if if we keep producing more and more co2 every year and this goes on for 50 years just even if we knew what to do, it would probably take 50 years to do it, to pay for it. Uh, we're going to end up with a lot of CO2 in the air. So what are our options? We could live with it, but I think the negatives are going to far outweigh the positives. And it's so everybody will agree that the world was a better place before we added the CO2 than, than after. Or we could um, put up something in the stratosphere that reflected away sunshine uh, <clears throat> and there is a way to do that that's probably ten times cheaper than dealing with the problem itself and that is to put 32 million tons of SO2 into the stratosphere every year that would on the average the reflectivity from the little sulfuric acid droplets that would be formed would compensate for doubling of CO2. You have to put it up every year, but it turns out if you do the arithmetic of how much it costs, it would be cheap comparing to change all of our infrastructure from you know fossil fuels to whatever. Uh, I think that's would be unfortunate if we had to do that but I think the likelihood that we'll get into that is rather high not right away but if things are bad uh, and we want to cool the planet it's a way to do it rather quickly and it's going to be a temptation so <clears throat> so we could cope with it we could reflect the equivalent amount of sunlight away and I mean you might ask what are the problems with that well one big problem is that it isn't going to return climate to what it was because on the average it will cool the planet the same amount as it warmed we could do that but the geographical distribution of rainfall and other things uh, would be different so it would create a different geography of climate than we have now and of course some nations would like that other nations would you know get very upset about it so there is there is one other way that we can go and I think that it's a reasonable way to go and that we'll probably get around to doing it but 
it's going to take a while <clears throat> to convince people that this is something we have to do. And that is, we could take CO2 back out of the atmosphere. You might say that's outrageous because the CO2 is only, there are only 400 molecules of CO2 for a million molecules of air, so it's very dilute. There's a person here at Columbia in the engineering school named Klaus Lochner. He got his degree in particle physics in Heidelberg. Uh, he worked uh, for La at Los Alamos in their theoretical division for 17 years, and then we hired him here. And he's devoted the last 13 years to figuring out the best way to take CO2 out of the air. And I'll describe, you know, what he would do. <clears throat> and he thinks that it can be done for less than a hundred dollars a ton. That would be very acceptable because that would only raise the price, let's say, of gasoline by 90 cents a gallon. So, you know, we're used to gasoline doing that kind of change. So that would be something we could do. We might not like it. There's a paper written by people at MIT published in the Proceedings of the National Academy that says it would cost $1,000 a ton. That would be $9 increase on a gallon of gasoline. And I've found that more people believe it's going to be like $600 a ton than believe it can be done at $100 a ton, and therefore nothing is being done about it. Okay, how would Lochner do it? Well, you need some substance that will suck up CO2 from the air. And in spacecraft, they have sodium hydroxide or something that they can bubble the spacecraft air through and take out the CO2. It gets uh, <clears throat> converted to bicarbonate or carbonate ion in the, in the basic solution. Um, but it turns out that to get that stuff back off, because you can't, whatever you absorb it on has to be recycled over and over again because it would be quite expensive. So um, you, you have to then take the CO2 off, concentrate it, liquefy it, and pump it into the ground. That's the whole thing. So Lochner is worried about the first step. How do you capture it and liquefy it? And then the other problem is where do you put it once you've done this? And he's a great believer in modular things. He said the reason computer prices have dropped orders of magnitude is that they're produced in very large numbers and uh, they last a finite amount of time and they get replaced and they get better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Same with automobiles, same with anything we make in large numbers. So he said we won't build things like power plants that uh, last for 50 years, we'll, we'll build smaller modules. And his ideal size would be a device that would take one ton of CO2 out of the air per day. And he envisions that dissembled, this would fit in a standard container. And that's, he's thinking of making all these in one place and then uh, shipping them to some place else on the earth where they would be installed. Because you could take the CO2 out of the air any place on earth. The air mixes rapidly, so you can't make a hole in CO2. But you could take it all out in Australia if that were, you know, seemed like a logical thing to do. Okay, so what is a ton a day of CO2? That's what 20 automobiles produce here in the U.S. So it means if you wanted to compensate for the production of CO2 by automobiles, you would have to have one of these devices for every automobile. Well, there's 70, I mean, one for every 20 automobiles. There's 70 million automobiles on the planet today, so that means you need three and a half million of these. So, I mean, I'm giving, this is not little stuff. I mean, we're going to do something. It's, 
it's big stuff. But he says we make, um, I think, 25 million containers every year. We make, what, 15 million or so automobiles. Uh, during World War II, we made an enormous number of airplanes and tanks in a very short period of time. So if we really had an emergency and decided we had to start really doing something big, this is something that could be done. Whereas if you want to refit power plants and things like that, which is another way to do part of it, not automobiles, not homes, but uh, electrical power plants, you could capture the CO2 from the stacks. But that involves putting up a device which is comparable in size and cost to the power plant itself, all the permissions you have to get, all the things. Whereas Klaus would say, his device may cost 30% more per unit of CO2 than taking it out of power plants, but it has this great advantage. You can put these devices where few people live, and the people who live there would be delighted to have some way to make a living. And so, you know, if you had an industry that did this, uh, they wouldn't uh, tell you to close it down, like we do with, you know, wind turbines. Uh, off Martha's Vineyard is a, is a no-no because they don't look nice. Um, and so he he has found a plastic that's embedded with little chemical islands that does a marvelous job of picking up CO2. And if you, you can actually go over, those of you who are here for the summer, you go to the 10th floor of the engineering building and ask for Alan Wright. Alan Wright will show you how this is done in a glove box size. So this is just, you know, very small scale. The, the, this plastic picks up CO2 like mad, and if you dip it in water, all the CO2 comes off and the, the sites that CO2 on are replaced with water. Then you put it back in the air, and the water comes off and is replaced with CO2. And it can be cycled over and over and over and over and over again without any uh, decrease in efficiency. So, but it's not, nobody has built a prototype because our fellow scientists are of different opinions about this for various reasons. But since this MIT group said it would cost thousand dollars a ton and Klaus says a hundred a lot of people say well we'll cut we'll take it and call it 500 well 500 is still too expensive um, and so what I've been trying to do is to help Lochner get the money to build prototypes so here we have the, the most important environmental problem the very serious problem one that you can make scenarios that would really bring down civilization. I mean, we're going to do things to the planet on a very large scale. Maybe that's a small probability, but uh, so is a nuclear exchange a small probability. And yet, on air capture, the total amount of money spent in the last 10 years is about $25 million. So during that time, we've spent the military spends, what, $500 billion a year, so they've spent 10 times $500 billion to defend us against God knows what. Uh, and we're not doing the same thing, and that's because people are really not convinced that this is a serious problem. I mean, some of us are, but unfortunately not a strong majority. Um, I want to say a couple other things about air capture, and then maybe I'll shut up and you can ask questions. <clears throat> We're going to, let's, I mean, the ideal thing is we started doing air capture as soon as possible, and that would alleviate the rise. We, and we would build up and eventually we could quell the rise as we transform our energy system to, from 85% fossil fuels to 85% renewables. 
But let's say we don't do that, and we finally uh, reach a time when we're not using fossil fuels, that we replace them with um, renewable energy, well, that's, and we stop raising CO2, well, it's going to take hundreds of years to go into the ocean. And really, that tail will extend out thousands of years, but uh, the big part of it will go into the ocean, but on a multi-century time scale. So if we, when this happens, let's see we're at 750 parts per million. I mean, I would be astounded if the world didn't say it's the disadvantages of that enormously outweigh the advantages. We want to go back to what the world looked like, you know, now or in 1850 or something. Then you could implement air capture and do it. Okay. So I would say that if we don't start doing it during the transition period, we're certainly going to do it afterwards. Which is, But we don't know how much it costs. If it costs $1,000 a ton, then it, it turns out we'll probably never do it because that's just too expensive. And that would mean a lot of energy has to go into it and so forth. Um, but there's another thing you can think of. There's a big movement to go to electrical cars that run on batteries, transportation system. That has, that's not a utopia of transportation. Those batteries wear out, they cost a lot to make. If you, if you do all the arithmetic, it alleviates the production of CO2, but it doesn't eliminate it. So one interesting thing that Lochner pushes is that if you could pull CO2 out of the air, and if you're running the planet on some other solar energy, wind energy, nuclear energy, you could then pull CO2 out of the air and combine it with hydrogen that you make in these power plants by dissociating oxygen and hydrogen in water, and you could combine the carbon and the CO2 with the hydrogen and make artificial gasoline, which would mean you'd have a fuel that would recycle completely. The CO2 would be pulled out of the air and then it would go back, so it wouldn't change the amount of CO2 in the air. And uh, it would produce water, and it would have no sulfur. It would be ideal. And of course, Nobody's ever going to create a vehicle that's better than a Toyota is now. I mean, with with batteries or hydrogen. So there's a should be a big incentive to see if we can preserve our our uh, transportation system without loading up the atmosphere with pollutants. Um, so. I think nothing's going to happen for 20 years. I mean, nothing of significance. We're nibbling, and we'll continue to nibble, and that's helpful. You know, we're being more efficient in using energy, and, and we're going in the right direction in the, the developed world. But meantime, the poor of the world are starting to use energy in quantities far bigger than, than we're saving, so uh, energy use is going to go up, and, and uh, most of that's going to come from fossil fuels. Um, so we've got what we learned when we were throwing, our ancestors were throwing garbage in the street, that that could cause lots of problems and disease and everything, and so we learned to collect garbage and put it away in a sensible way. Our, our waterways got badly polluted with sewage, and we bit the bullet, and very, you know, each city uh, put in sewage plants, and, and we've largely alle alleviated that problem. Now we're loading the atmosphere, using the atmosphere as a CO2 garbage can, and we just can't do that. And so the what's going to have to happen, I think, is we put a price on carbon one way or another. So when you take carbon out of the ground, 
matter what you're going to do with it, it's 99% of it is going to get burned one way or another. You have to pay to take it back out of the air. It's pay to capture it. And so the price of getting the carbon out is built into the price of fuels. And of course that really helps uh, non-fossil fuel energy because it, it, it uh, makes it easier for them to compete with fossil fuel. So I'll stop here and I'll say this is a huge problem. I'm glad I'm going to die soon. <laughs> I mean, or well before the shit hits the fan. But, <laughs> but anybody here in their 20s, you're going to spend the rest of your life concerned with this problem. It is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it could cause real trouble on the planet because it's you know, just food alone. So I'll stop, and uh, you can beat on me and say, you don't know what you're talking about, broker, and maybe I don't. So. So Okay, well, thanks, Wally. We're, we're going to have people come to the mic if you'd like to ask a question because we're taping and the floor is open. You can... um, I was intrigued by your use of uh, the, the analogies of that we learn to clean our riverways and get rid of the sewage and we learn to kind of get rid of the trash out of the streets. And I'm wondering, it seems like one of the benefits of that is that it, you can immediately see the benefits. Yeah. It's a visible, tangible kind of disease, we're getting rid of disease. People are getting healthier. Uh, it's not as uh, nasty to look at every day. We're making it, the environment prettier. Uh, but it seems like the analogy kind of breaks down because if you assume that we could take the carbon out and do something about climate change, I'm wondering what the, what the, what the analogy would be about the kind of the benefits that we would see. What would be the tangible kind of things that we can kind of observe and say we're actually doing something good for humanity as well as ourselves? We are dead right. I mean, uh, the CO2 is much different because you can't see it. It's a long-term problem. I mean, the thing you should think of is what kind of world are you leaving for your great-grandchildren? And uh, is, is it, they may look back and say, you all were really awful. You were as bad as the Nazis. You were putting CO2 in the air, and you knew damn well it was going to make a lot of trouble, yet you kept doing it because you didn't want to spend the money to stop it. So, I, I mean, that's a harder sell, but that's basically the way to think about it, is that the, the warming and changes are so slow and we have all of the climate noise superimposed on it so we can't say Sandy wouldn't have happened if there were no CO2 in the atmosphere. I, I mean, it probably would have. So, uh, it, 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 it's going to be very hard to do what you do with sewage because you take sewage away you start to see the benefits right away. There's less typhoid, there's less this or whatever. Uh, but um, I'm a scientist. It's somebody else's problem to figure out <laughs> how to sell this to humanity. I can sort of lay out the basic facts, but I can't. I, well, I said in the meeting before that with the students that um, I don't think we're going to come to grips with the problem until we create an entity, a global entity, like the UN, but not the UN, that controls carbon and has somewhat dictatorial powers about regulating carbon, charging for it and so forth. That's very idealistic and it may never, probably won't ever happen, but I think if we're going to really do something to prevent the worst, we should have such an entity.
Um, you said that you think that uh, the biggest impacts uh, that are going to harm human welfare are going to come with um, uh, potential declines in food production. And so, um, I mean, if, if you want to make an argument for, uh, for adaptation, then um, shouldn't that be a focus, you know, in uh, boosting um, production of foodstuffs or finding ways to... You said that earlier that you didn't think there would be another green revolution, but, I mean, wouldn't the logic of that position dictate that we try to yeah. find one? Yeah, I mean, it's clear. I mean, the, the estimates are that the increase in CO2 is going to decrease food production. And, you know, estimates range from doubling in CO2, maybe 10% reduction in food production, grain production, to as much as 30%. And with an increase in population, that means the per capita food goes way down. Um, so we are going to have to adapt because CO2 is going to go up. Uh, I got, I've listened to, you know, I'm not an agricultural expert. And I don't really know, you know, how to evaluate what people say about this. But I, I read while, well, uh, last spring that Bill Gates had given $25 million to a plant physiologist at Illinois to try to figure out a way to um, compensate for this. And I uh, got in touch with him because I figured if he got that much money, he must know what he's doing. And uh, he gave a rather bleak outlook. He's going to try to jack up photosynthesis, and that's what this money is going to go to. I mean, the idea of moving agriculture somewhere else on the planet, I don't that's not going to work. I mean, uh, our great grain belts are in temper temperate latitudes, and you know, we can't, you know, move them to cooler places. Um, I'm sure, you know, we can, like in the Netherlands, they've really intensified agriculture, but of course that often requires more water, and, and water is going to be, you know, one of the problems. So, I mean, that would hit home. I mean, if we start to have more serious global food problems, uh, somebody said stop eating beef. Okay, that's a nice thought, but who's going to do it? So if we run short of grain, you could say, well, if we, if the rich people stopped eating beef, then that would help. But what's going to happen? They'll have enough money to buy beef, and it'll be the poor people on the planet who suffer because their food prices will go way up. So I mean, it's it's the poor on the planet that are going to take a beating on all this. The rich will be able to you know, air condition themselves out of it, you might say. Does that, did I answer your question or I say too many <laughs> words? I usually say too many words when I answer <laughs> questions. My wife says I should be, brevity is a virtue. Uh, I have a question about um, deep sea carbon sequestration. Uh, and I was just wondering if there's been any research on I mean, earlier on you alluded to uh, how there could be some minor leakages when you're storing it, but either research on that or like in the event there was an actual like break in the pipes or something like that, would that have enough to affect sort of general uh, pH levels in the ocean through, you know, global cir thermal haline circulation or? Well, I think if there were leaks, it would mainly get back to the atmosphere. Um, and so it would undo what you're trying to do, and so you might have to take some CO2 out twice. So one of the things we should learn is um, by doing pilot experiments is if we put the CO2 away, what does it do? I, I mentioned before that stat oil has done the only really um, significant experiment in this regard. For 15, 16, 17 years, they've been taking CO2 out of methane that they pump up from below the 
North Sea. And they decided rather than pay Norway's carbon tax and let it go to the air, they would take the CO2 out on the platform out on the North Sea, liquefy it, and send it back down to a higher level in that sandstone. They've been doing this for 17 years. And since CO2 has a different density than the water that was in the sandstone before, in the pores, they can see it seismically, so they can see what's happening to it. And it's gradually moving up because the, the liquid CO2 is less dense than, than the water in the aquifer, so it tends to migrate up. Uh, but it's going very slowly. And they've done calculations that it's gradually dissolving in the water. I mean, you've got to get the CO2 and water together, and then it'll dissolve in the water. And there's infinitely more water down there than there is CO2. And they, when that happens, the CO, they, the CO2 loaded water becomes more dense than either liquid CO2 or normal water, and it's going to be like a fountain. It's going to go back down again before it reaches a shale cap, which would be a great impedance to it leaking, but there, you know, there may be fractures through the cracks and stuff would get up. And of course, 1% leakage is not trivial because we're going to have to put a lot of carbon away. And uh, so the amount stored is going to get greater and greater, and that 1% is going to get greater and greater. And of course, you'd have to then pay to put it back. Uh, but I think that there are plenty of, of places to store CO2 where the likelihood of it coming back is small. I'm involved a little bit. I helped get this started with a project in Iceland where we're putting uh, CO2 dissolved in water down into basalt. Of course, Iceland is all basalt. And that's interesting if you can pay for the water because you could put it in seawater, put it in any kind of water. Uh, once it's in water, if the partial pressure in the water is less than the confining pressure, it has no tendency to come out. Plus, we find that basalt, CO2 reacts very rapidly with basalt, and it dissolves out magnesium and calcium ions. And that makes the CO2 into bicarbonate. It's no longer gas, so it no longer wants to come out. So it may be that putting it in basalts will turn out to be uh, a good way to do it. Um, but we're, we're not doing the research we should do. And it mm -hmm. would cost a pittance of what the real thing is going to cost. And it's just a crime that because Republicans don't like to even think about it, Obama is doing very little. And even in his talk, I mean, he's not doing daring things. He's doing routine things. Uh, we should be, I mean, it would be nice to have a Manhattan Project for what to do about CO2 and, and really have some very, very bright people uh, figuring out both how to capture it and how to store it. We're not doing that, or we're doing it at a very low level. I said, maybe I said in the lecture, that the amount of money we've spent on air capture in 10 years is $25 million. Nothing, I mean, compared to what we spend for AIDS or tuberculosis or, you know, any other problems we have on the planet, we're avoiding this one. We're just acting as if it's not going to hurt us. Uh, thank you. There have been attempts to seed the Antarctic Ocean with iron in order to create a biological bloom, but I think those tests have failed. Do you have any opinion about something as radical as seeing iron in the ocean. I have very strong opinions about that. Um, 
We used to have a man named Cyrus Leventhal was head of our biology department here at Columbia. And he used to tell me that, there, can I name a paper written by people who do biological studies in the ocean that would be at what we call a home run, a scientific home run, and I never could do that. And then a man named John Martin came along and astounded everybody by uh, doing experiments on the decks of ships that showed that there's so little iron in ocean water that if you add a little bit more, you raise productivity. And people didn't believe that. And uh, so uh, experiments were designed where iron was added to patches of water in the ocean that have been done 8, 10, 12 places. And every time, it does increase productivity and it does increase the export of organic material down. But I was involved early on. You do models and say, what good is this going to do? Well, the only place that will do any good is where there's a lot of unused nitrogen and phosphate, because iron alone won't make plants grow. They need carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Carbon's in great abundance, so there's no problem there. But in most, probably 50% of the ocean, there's virtually no phosphorus and nitrogen in the water. As fast as it gets there, the plants grab it. Uh, but in the southern ocean, there's a lot of unused nutrients, so that was the idea. So various people have done models that if you uh, continually fertilized the southern ocean, uh, what good would it do? Well, if you, if you poured iron all over the place, it would alleviate more than the Prius does, but maybe five times what the Prius does. Not a, it would have an effect, but it would be small. Plus, you would probably make the thermocline of the southern ocean anaerobic which would really play hob with the biological cycles in the Southern Ocean. So, whereas I think iron fertilization was important in glacial time in drawing the CO2 down, and we know it was down, uh, I don't think that that will ever be done in the ocean. There are people who have companies to do that and they want to get cap and trade credits for doing that. And the, the thing is, if they do it for a few years, what happens is all the organic material they produce gets eaten in the thermocline, and it gets mixed back up to the surface, and it returns. So iron fertilization is not send the stuff down into the sediments where it's gone forever. The food chain in the ocean is very efficient. So something like 1% of the organic material that's food produced by photosynthesis gets to the deep parts of the ocean, as it, 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 organisms all along the way of, that, are, that are consuming it. So um, it's not San Francisco Chronicle or whatever it is had an article that said, John Martin irons out the CO2 problem. <laughs> And, uh, he made an incredible discovery, and Cyrus Leventhal by that time was dead, mm -hmm. and I rude the fact that John Martin didn't find it while Leventhal was alive, so I could tell him, there's the home run, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful piece of work. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it won't help us. Well, I have a question. Uh, there's this umbrella term. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad you said controlling carbon because people do talk about controlling climate, and that might be a, a tougher control problem to control the whole system rather than one part of it. Uh, but uh, this question of an overarching term called geoengineering, which is a, is a kind of a crude way of subsuming carbon capture and storage and uh, albedo modification. And now the, the National Research Council is starting a new study. What kind of research, how much research, how much should be 
out-of-door research uh, on geoengineering. That's the name of their study. And I'd like to get your sense of, uh, uh, you made a compelling case for modul modular uh, incremental ramped up research on uh, carbon capture. And, and maybe we'll get to the point where it takes off. But what, what kind of uh, outdoor experimentation, if any, could we uh, pr promote on, uh, on solar radiation changes? And, uh, and should it all be called geoengineering? No, I have a, <laughs> geoengineering has a bad connotation. I mean, and I think that carbon capture is not really geoengineering, it's garbage removal. I mean, we don't call garbage removal geoengineering. Mm -hmm. It involves, you know, big trucks and so forth. Uh, and sewage plants are, you know, big things. Um, but albedo modification, there you're really doing uh, geoengineering. And so I would restrict the term to that and say you're, you're trying to, mm -hmm. with taking CO2, you're undoing something you did. Mm -hmm. Albedo modification, you're, you're, you're changing the system and, and it's not going to be a one-to-one -one reduction. It's going to be complicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to have different effects in different parts of the world. So some countries will say, this is great, it helped us. Other countries will say, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't do it in one place. The, these aerosols, you could probably load one hemisphere more heavily than another. But you can't do any better than that, because the stratosphere is going to spread it all around. And, uh, Cross equator might be a little slower, but mm -hmm. generally you'd be doing the whole world, mm -hmm. and you could fill in gaps probably if you had a way to add it. You know, when when I wrote a paper on this in 1985 with my friend John Knuckles at Livermore, uh, we I did a calculation of how much it would cost, and so I called up Freeport Sulphur. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him, you know, how much it was a ton, and he said $110 a ton, that will be Freeport, Louisiana. And he said, how much do you want? And I said, 30 million tons a year. <laughs> and he said, wow, that's the amount we use to make sulfuric acid. So, um, but that would have cost then something like 10 or 20, $20 billion. And then I called up Boeing, and asked how much <clears throat> would, you know, there's 707, I guess they had at that time, and I was going to fly them up to the stratosphere, <clears throat> would take a fleet of 700 747s flying around the clock, loading them up, taking them up to where you have to dump it, dumping the SO2 and coming back down. That would have been at that time another 20 billion. This is a trillion dollar problem, so when you look at it that way, it's very tempting to modify albedo. Yeah. I'm curious to get the opinion of the author of How to Build a Habitable Planet. Um, what do you think of the colonization of Mars as a prospect? <laughs> what was that? What do you think of the colonizing possibility Mars. of the colonization mm -hmm. of Mars? Colonizing Mars. Mars. And go to somewhere well, else. Colonizing of... Mars is nonsense. <laughs> It's well, like I mean, the amount of cost it would be to get people up there and, and to maintain them. And, you know, they, there's water up there somewhere, but they don't really know where it is. I mean, it would be a joke. I mean, to, it wouldn't be cost effective, <laughs> let's put it that way. I mean, it, if you were short of space, that you could manage to do it on the planet. You're going to ship a billion people up to Mars or something. So you'd only do it as a stunt, which is what we did. Well, at least when we went to the moon, we could bring things back. But they're thinking of, if men went to Mars, they'd never come back. They couldn't get them back. So you'd have to donate your life and die on Mars and hope somebody buried you, I guess, if mm. anybody left. Uh, I, 
I was involved with Biosphere 2, which probably many people in this room never heard of, but it was a cult and in Arizona that got $250 million to build this gigantic greenhouse that was totally sealed. It was a wonderful thing. People that did it were crazy. And I got involved just because the oxygen was going down and they wanted to know why and what to do about it. Uh, but their idea was to colonize Mars. So you call up John Allen and he'll give you a different story. He was the, the cult guru uh, who did all the bad things any cult leader that you know about. <clears throat> Except he didn't kill people. <laughs> Well, this, I, I can't resist. There's a footnote. The, the second failure of Biosphere 2 was the crew mutiny. So the, the first failure was the CO2 problem, right? The oxygen problem. The buildup. And then the second problem was the crew mutinied on the second experiment and broke the airlock. No, what happened So, so was well, anyway, the, one, one was biochemical and one was uh, social. No, they didn't break the airlock. Okay. Actually, uh, Ed Bass, whose father was a very, very wealthy Texas oil man, had four sons. When they got to 21, each son got a billion dollars. Daddy said, that's it. Don't <laughs> ask me for more money. Well, Ed, one of them, got captured by this cult and put in 20... 250 million, so it'd be a quarter of his inheritance to build this thing in Arizona. And it was operating, and these people who were operating were spendthrifts, and they were getting, I mean, I can, I know a lot of the stories about how they spent the money. Well, he had very conservative Texas money managers, and, and they were like oil and water. I mean, you know, they were totally different in every way, you know, philosophy of life and so forth. So it was a big battle and eventually the the financial people won. And on April first, I forget which year now, the sheriff in Arizona moved in and and threw the cult out. But the eight biospherians were still in there. And uh, John Allen, the guru, was over in Japan doing something. He flew back, and he asked them to come out. And they said, we don't want to come out. So they stayed in. But uh, they were already adding oxygen, because if you build a closed thing like that, you don't have very much air in there. And so bacteria in the soil are eating up oxygen. The plants are producing it. And it's very, very difficult to balance those two. And what happened is they put far too much organic material in the soil, so the bacteria outpaced the photosynthesis and oxygen went down. And uh, they eventually had to bring in tank trucks of liquid oxygen and, and replace it. Um, but we then Columbia, I was head of, when they, when they kicked the cult out, they hired a company to try to transition it to some other organization, which eventually became Columbia University. But since I was trying to figure out this oxygen thing, I became head of science <laughs> at Biosphere <laughs> 2. I don't know if I should admit that. I got you and then Columbia took over, and I was still the head of science. And when Bollinger came in, he was astounded that we were trying to run something that was that far away and on a you know, fairly large scale. And so I agreed with him that we should shut it down and Columbia should pull out because it, you know, it wasn't, it had huge potential, but we weren't able to achieve that potential. And so we pulled out. Um, I think it cost Columbia something like $40 million in total to pull out and to run it while they had it. It cost a lot of money. That was Michael Crow, who now is one of the ten top presidents of universities. He's at Arizona State 
and transforming that from a party school into a pretty good entity, you know, a research university. But he, he was able here to go from almost nothing in intellectual property income to the peak years of, he was getting $145 million a year. And he was allowed to spend about a third of that. And so the, some of that went to, you know, funding Biosphere. But Columbia, to say something good about it, uh, <laughs> one of uh, our postdocs uh, agreed to go out there and start an educational program. And she did a marvelous job. We had Columbia and Barnard students who went there. This was a semester Im immersion program with field trips and students come back, they would say, and these are students now that take the, our Frontiers course and hate it, I mean, same kind of student. They loved it. And they thought it was one of their best semesters at Columbia. But we couldn't support it with Columbia and Barnard students, there weren't enough of them. So you had to get other students, and Columbia tuition is too high, and that's what killed the engineer. Mm -hmm. The re education program, which was that's a tragedy because that mm -hmm. was really good. Well, I think that should be written up as how to build a habitable biosphere too. <laughs> I have a. <laughs> Do you have I a? wrote an article okay. in GSA Today about how you would build one. Okay. That's a very interesting thing. You, you probably. I mean, I know what I would do. I would make sure that the plants produce more oxygen than the uh, uh, soils, and you would have to you, you would have to have uh, wooden things in there. You'd have to cheat in a way because you'd have to have ingredients in there to balance it. Otherwise, they the first year they almost starved. And part of it was they grew the wrong plants. The other part was that it was an El Nino year and it was very cloudy. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't get as much sunshine. And in a cloudy year, they would have grown 20% more. And you know, that's the 20% in food production can make a big difference. So uh, they changed the what they grew, a Tibetan agriculturalist uh, advised them on what to grow and they, they had no food problem. They had twice as much as they needed. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Cool. Another question? Uh, yes, uh, the Keystone Pipeline, uh, to pump the bitumen or the tar down through the pipeline, you have to mix it with the water. And I want, I've never heard anything about the pollution of the water and the large amount of water needed to mix with the, or to dilute with the tar to pump it down. Is the water factor an issue environmentally, or is it just the fact that, um, because just recently a science group has determined that the, the mixture, the diluted mixture, will not be any more uh, damaging to the pipe long term versus conventional oil being pumped. And I, so I just wonder if the water is an issue. I mean, it's, I mean, from an environmental standpoint, it's bad. But um, we had a debate while I was at Arizona State, and I learned a lot about it from that sort of discussion. And I mean, there are issues like energy independence. So if we get stuff from Canada, they're our friends. And rather than, you know, the Arab countries that, you know, could turn against us at any time. Um, uh, what was the other issue? Well, water is, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've seen, I'm one of the few people who've seen the thing, we have a building called the Gary C. Comer Geochemical Laboratory at Lamont, and Gary Comer took us all, several of us up there and flew us around in a small plane over it. And it's a mess, you know, they're digging up all this sand and they 
and huge equipment, you know, with tires that are, what, 15 feet high or something. They put it in uh, conveyor belts and take it into a, heat it up, get the tar off, sand comes out looking like ordinary beach sand, mm -hmm. but they're just tearing up a huge track. I was interested in it because the reason they can get at that sand is there was a terrible flood went through there at the end of glacial time and ripped away the overburden. And so the, now they can just drive around and pull it up. Most of that tar sand is under, uh, I don't know, 100 feet of overburden or something. And so they'll never be able to take it off. They'll have to solution mine it. They'll have mm -hmm. to send down hot water and take it off in situ. And uh, so that's a question, how much do they really have? They claim they have a one Saudi Arabia worth of oil. But my view of all this, it's, I don't worry, I mean about, I'm worried about CO2. It trumps everything else, I think. And so it would be nice if the tar sands would stay in the ground. But let's say we deny the pipeline. What's going to happen? Canadians will hate us because, well, this, this, look what Norway got out of their oil. They're now one of the richest countries in the world. Canada could follow. Um, so they would try to build a pipeline to Vancouver or to the Arctic, if the Arctic opens mm -hmm. up, it's closer to the Arctic, and they'll find a way to get it to China, and they'll get burned anyway. Uh, we won't get polluted by it, but... So I'm glad that I'm not Obama who has to make a decision on it, because it's not mm -hmm. cut and dry. I mean, you can make strong arguments on either side. But if you're strictly environmental, I would agree, it's a, it's a mess. I, there was a thing in the New York Times that there's a refinery in Detroit that's been operating since January or something, and they showed a picture of the sludge that comes out, which I never, you know, you don't get, you don't convert everything, you mm -hmm. end up with slag like mines. They had, what, a pile that was three stories high and, and uh, two or three city blocks long, just in, in a few months. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what are they going to do with that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. it pollute the groundwater? I mean, I don't know. This is not, you know, not things that I personally study, so I don't mm -hmm. really, can't say much more than anybody else about mm -hmm. it. Well, uh, we're glad you're not Obama too, and uh, but we are glad you're here with us because of, of the perspective I think you've given us by, by having this in and out, this very intimate knowledge of Earth processes down to the chemical level. And I think it, it really speaks you know, well for, for that kind of study, for people of any discipline. If you go to go off and be historians and social scientists, I think you should have some grounding in some of these earth processes that you're so clear on. So thank you for, thank you for giving us this overview and a perspective on CO2. Send me a letter in heaven or hell, wherever I am, and tell me what really happened in between now and 2070. Yeah. Because a lot's going to happen, and I really wish I could see it all, because it's going to be very complicated how it plays out. And, uh, Maybe, you know, the whole thing could be a dud because mm -hmm. it's possible the planet won't heat that much and it's possible it will be a bloody disaster yeah. because it heats up, you know, cool. a lot. I think knowing the Hertug staff, they can probably arrange those letters to be sent. So <laughs> thank you for being with us tonight and uh, I want to thank you, Wallace.